Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. My name is Justin Reich. I'm the Executive Director of the International Churchill Society. I'm also the Program Director of the National Churchill Leadership Center at George Washington University. And I thank you for joining me from wherever you are. I am really thrilled today to be joined by best-selling author Neil Ferguson to discuss his new book, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. Ferguson was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine in 2004 and is currently a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, Institution at Stanford University. Thank you so much for joining me, Neil. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you, Justin, and to be once again uh, addressing this uh, important uh, body. Yes, so uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind two people, uh, excuse me, the audience of, of three things. First, a little later in this conversation, uh, Neil and I will be joined by Kath Kathleen Fox, who is George Washington University's Assistant Vice President for Health and Safety. Second, this conversation is being recorded and will be free to watch on the Society's YouTube page in the coming days. In third, we will be taking questions from the audience later in the conversation. So please use the Q&A function of Zoom to submit your questions. I know Neil is certainly eager to answer them. Um, Neil, so it, I was first going to kick this off up until this morning uh, to you know, ask about the impetus of, of you writing this book. But um, I wanted to have your uh, response, if you will, to an incredible testimony this morning by Dominic Cummings uh, to a select committee uh, of parliament in the UK regarding the COVID response of the UK government, which you certainly touch on in your book. Um, I, I saw you were tweeting about it and I was wondering if you could expand upon that and, and make some connections uh, to your book and, and to his testimony. Well, I, I should acknowledge, disclose that I know uh, Dom Cummings and uh, I've known him for some years, but we're not close friends. Uh, I was fascinated by what he had to say today and also by the kind of trailer that he ran on, on Twitter earlier this week, a long thread setting out kind of what he was going to say, because it, it goes to the heart of the question, what went wrong in 2020 in the UK and perhaps uh, in the Western world as a whole. Clearly, uh, Dominic is not sparing in his criticism of Boris Johnson, the prime minister, and he's even uh, more uh, damning in what he has to say about the health secretary, Matt Hancock. But I think the broad uh, takeaway of his testimony is that this was a general failure of government that extended through the, the public health bureaucracy and the expert advisors to the government. And the nature of the failure was not that they didn't have a pandemic preparedness plan. They did. It was just useless. Uh, the, the problem was a very, very sluggish response. Uh, even when it was obvious, as it was obvious to me in January of 2020, that the pandemic was happening and it was going to spread very rapidly uh, throughout Europe, uh, the Americas and the rest of the world. If one reads carefully what he's said today and what he tweeted earlier this week, you see that there was a comprehensive systemic failure of the government response. And uh, it's therefore not enough to say Boris Johnson was an incompetent populist. If he hadn't been prime minister, none of this would have happened and the excess mortality in the UK would not have been so great. I think the key point is the failure was a systemic failure. Of course, there will be people who will heap opprobrium on Dom Cummings. He's never been short of enemies in the British media, as well as in, in uh, British politics and, and the British civil service. So a lot of people will try to discredit what he said. But I think it's important to notice that he's been critical of himself. Uh, he acknowledges his own responsibility, he began by apologizing uh, uh, and acknowledging his own, his own share in the failure. And my view is that this is actually so far the most candid acknowledgement of what went wrong from almost any Western official. A similar story can certainly be told about what went wrong in the US. And I try to tell it towards the end of doom, of course, Inevitably, it's very much a first draft of history, 
uh, given that this pandemic isn't even over. But I sense that a similar picture will emerge here too. I'm so um, I'm so glad you you just uttered the phrase the first draft of history. Let's talk about uh, and please describe in detail the impetus for you to write this book. You, know, you, you definitely touch on it in the introduction, but for those who have not yet read the book, tell us how Doom came to pass. Well, I wanted to write a history of disasters generally, and I'd been mulling over how to do this uh, throughout 2019. One way in which I was approaching the problem was to read a lot of science fiction, because I'm interested in the history of the future. That is to say the disasters that imaginative authors have it, it tried to, to visualize and to uh, put into print. So I was badgering my editors in New York and London with the idea of a book about dystopian ends and the, the, way, the way our species or our planet ends. Uh, before I'd got really past first base with that pitch, uh, the, uh, the pandemic began. And I found that in January of last year, the minute uh, I realized that we were uh, in the early phase of a pandemic, my concentration on all other things was gone. And I just had to focus on the unfolding uh, historic disaster. And that was when I realized that what I could usefully do would be to relate what was happening to the broad history of, of, of disaster of all forms. So the book is a, is a history of disasters. And it, it's also a theory of history, which says, you can't really ever predict these things. It doesn't matter whether we call them man-made or natural. Disasters just keep happening in unpredictable ways and unpredictable times in unpredictable places. And what is puzzling about the recent past is that we seem to be getting worse at managing them. And that, that therefore creates a rather urgent need to do uh, some analysis of what went wrong just in the way that Dominic Cummings has been doing. So in the later part of the book, I, I attempt this first uh, history of, of the pandemic. Of course, it's incomplete. I say that from the outset. I had to send the thing off to get printed at the end of October. So it doesn't give you uh, this week's news. It doesn't give you anything since really November. But I thought it was important to write the book now rather than to wait who knows how long for the pandemic definitively to be over because we need to learn. We, we really urgently need to learn from our mistakes before the next disaster strikes. And there's just no knowing when that will be and what form it will take. In the book, you write, quote, pandemics invariably lead to other forms of disaster, economic, social, and political. So if I may ask you to put your uh, forward thinking uh, cap on, of, of those subsequent forms of disaster, what what is what is the pandemic of COVID nineteen going to produce? One really defining characteristic of big disasters in history is is that they cause cascades of disaster or chain reactions, if you prefer. And that is to say that it's not just that the First World War kills north of ten million people in 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 conventional warfare. It's the fact that it blows up the Russian Empire and hands it. Uh, to the Bolsheviks that really makes it a historic epoch-making uh, event. So what's very important when you're studying a disaster is the question, what will the consequences be? And will it be one of those, I call them Dragon King disasters, that, that, that unleashes a cascade uh, of disaster comparable with those of, uh, of the period after 1917-18? It's a little early to know just how big the cascade will be. There is also the possibility that a completely unrelated disaster could occur that wouldn't be part of a cascade at all, uh, and one can't rule that out. But for me, the most obvious cascades right now are the ones that lead from massive expansion of, uh, of the deficit and monetary financing to inflation, which seems already to be happening uh, in the US. And that, that's going to have all kinds of economic as well as social consequences and the escalation of what I've been calling Cold War II for the last three years between the United States and, and China. That, that got a lot colder, if that's the right uh, way of putting it, in 2020. And there is no sign of detente at this point. If anything, uh, rather unexpectedly for some people, the tone has got more heated between the United States uh, and, and China since Joe Biden became president. That, that part of 
Donald Trump's policy has been continued and, if anything, somewhat ramped up by, by the new administration. Now, that really could produce a, a disaster in a relatively short time frame because a US-China war would make the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war look like the really quite small conflicts that they were. So I think that's the, the sort of obvious near-term uh, cascade. I'd add one more thing. If you try to imagine what that war will be like, and this is always the challenge, that the war of the future is not like the war of the past, you should factor in massive cyber attack and potentially huge disruption of uh, US infrastructure, including the internet itself. Because let's face it, if you really wanted to throw this country into chaos, the easiest way would be to just close down the internet and make it impossible for us to, to communicate with our laptops and our our cell phones. So those are the things in my mind as I try to think ahead to what comes next. Of course, there's a kind of preference in elite circles to talk about climate change because that is the disaster we find most interesting, or at least people in the elite find most interesting. I don't dismiss that. It's a very, really, really serious problem. And if anything, the probability of disaster in that domain has gone up, not least because of China's uh, increasing CO2 emissions. But I think a key point the book makes is that if we only fixate on that disaster, if that's the one disaster we prepare for, we'll be blindsided again, uh, just as we were last year. Um, and speaking of fiction and science fiction, just an aside, I don't know if you've read um, Admiral Jim Sivrius's book or have heard of it, 2034, spoke to him a couple of weeks ago about that, depicts the exact scenario that you're referring to, the, the, um, the technological war between China and the United States. Um, so for I like any that of those who are- very much, uh, Justin. I, I, I just, I said to Jim Stavridis, as a friend, there's only one thing I don't like, and that's the date. You seem to me to be putting this out far too far. This scenario yeah. seems to me really quite, quite close in terms of uh, its likely timing. You could even imagine a showdown over Taiwan next year. Uh, after the uh, perhaps after the Beijing Winter Olympics, because if you're Xi Jinping, you don't have limitless time. And there's the danger that the US could actually improve its deterrence with respect to Taiwan over the next few years. This is actually probably a rather small window of opportunity when they could plausibly uh, take Taiwan and, and not have to worry about uh, a serious military response, because as everybody knows in defense circles, in all the war games in recent years, the US loses any attempt to yeah. take Taiwan back after an invasion. Moving to, back to the book, um, for those who have not yet read it on, on the call and, and, and who also missed your Wall Street Journal uh, piece and review a couple weeks ago, can you briefly describe your analysis of the uh, flu of 1957-58 of with what we've experienced right now? Well, many people last year when they were trying to find analogies, talked about the 1918-19 Spanish influenza that, that came at the tail end of World War I. And this, of course, led to a great deal of anxiety because uh, that was a really catastrophic pandemic, one of the world's worst. Uh, it killed somewhere between 1.5 uh, and 1.8% and of the world's population. Uh, if we'd had a, a comparable experience, then we would be counting the dead and in the tens of millions, not, not the millions worldwide. I felt back in March that when the other Neil Ferguson was making projections of 2.2 million American dead, that, that it was probably not going to be that bad. Uh, and that it might be more like the 1957-58 Asian flu, which few people now remember for the reason that it wasn't as bad, nearly as bad as 1918-19. That was a pandemic that globally killed somewhere around 0.04% of the world's population, so far as we can work out. Now, I think COVID is going to be worse than that. Uh, by the time it's done, it's just recently kind of overtaken the Asian flu in terms of the world population share. And maybe that number is, in fact, understated, as you may have seen, The Economist and uh, and a couple of other uh, agencies are, are estimating a higher death toll. So I think we're going to end up with a worse experience than 1957-58, but not nearly as bad as 1918-19. Plus, 
57, 58 saw a lot of young people get sick. The excess mortality amongst teenagers was very high. And that means that the number of life years lost was much higher than in our pandemic when the elderly were disproportionately killed. Okay, that's the, the throat clearing uh, part. The comparison's not perfect, but it's better, definitely better than 1918, 19. Okay. Our response is totally different. In 1957, 58, there's no state of emergency. There are no school closures. There are no lockdowns. In fact, life goes on. There is excess mortality. It comes in two waves. The Eisenhower administration says, we can't stop the spread. Our policy is a vaccine. Go get a vaccine. And that's what we're going to focus on. Now, I think that the striking feature of that policy is a, that it means there's almost no economic disruption detectable. I mean, you just can't see that pandemic in the economic data. Secondly, I think society is just different in the 1950s. And so you can effectively assume that the population will accept some level of excess mortality without mass panic, uh, that the issue of public health won't be a partisan issue. There won't be one party in favor of vaccines and the other against it. And so it's an option for the Eisenhower administration to say to people, there is a new strain of flu, this is going to be quite rough, but keep calm and carry on, to use a cliche from, from the United Kingdom. Uh, but it, it does seem like the, the change the difference that's really striking is in the government's response and the public response. The, the challenge is similar. And that's really the point that I try to make in the book. In terms of the, the public health impact, th this is not too different. And yet our response in 1957-58 is completely different from our response in 2020-21. And it's partly because they just don't have the option to tell people to work from home. I mean, a large proportion of Americans don't even have telephones in 1957. And there isn't the option to work from home. And we had an option that they didn't have, which was just to shut everything down. Uh, and we did. And that, of course, is why the economic consequences of COVID-19 are actually in some ways greater than the public health consequences. I was just going to ask um, as a follow up. Technology, of course, has changed light years from from 1957-58 and you touched on it. many people didn't have phones. Do you think technology has um, exacerbated the pandemic in, you know, in, you know, quantitative measurable ways? One of the arguments I make in the book is that the history of science is in many ways two, two steps forward and one step back, sometimes two steps back, because at the same time as we understand things like viruses better, uh, to the point that we can sequence their genetic structure in just days uh, of a new virus appearing, we've made ourselves at the same time more vulnerable to a novel pathogen by building the most networked integrated world that ever was. And a previous book I wrote, The Square and the Tower, essentially argued that we created the sort of networked world and noticed only the benefits and underestimated the downsides. Well, what happened in 2020 was a pretty good illustration that if you've created unprecedented volumes of, of long haul flights from Wuhan to San Francisco and New York, not to mention European destinations, uh, you, you have a, a, a really powerful contagion spreading machine. The other thing that's really striking is that the way that the internet has transformed news uh, into something that you kind of consume almost uh, by doom scrolling, to use a term that seems apposite, uh, means that the public is much more susceptible to fake news and extreme views than it was in the 1950s. And I think that has actually made the, the policy response harder. Uh, of course, communications by the public health bureaucracy have not been great. But they've also been contending with an epidemic or pandemic of fake news, conspiracy theories, uh, quack remedies and, and, and arguments against vaccines that are mostly completely spurious. I do think that's one of the ways in which uh, we've made our lives more difficult because, because technology has enabled us to build these giant platforms like Facebook and YouTube that really are just engines for disseminating misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, I remember in the height uh, of the pandemic, reading something about how silver could could cure COVID. Yeah, and so yeah, what a garlic. fascinating. Don't fasc forget garlic. garlic. <laughs> there was a lot of that, and television masks were also causing it. There were people who actually chopped down. Uh, 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 That's right, the five G transmitting yeah. ma ma five G masks, uh, not television masks, five G masks in the UK. So, I mean, the craziness. 
is amusing until you realize how many people believe it. And the polling data, uh, which I quote in the book on some of the conspiracy theories uh, are really shocking. Uh, really large proportions of Americans believe conspiracy theories that, that you know, educated people like the ones I suspect on this call would, would regard as preposterous. But it, it's when you see how widespread these conspiracy theories are and how widely believed they are that you understand why our response to this pandemic veered from complacency at the beginning, oh, it's just the seasonal flu, which was a, a, a view that spread throughout the mainstream and social media, to panic, it's, you know, it's the movie contagion. It's very hard to get people into a middle ground of rational behavior when there's this kind of misinformation and disinformation out there. And the infodemic really did make the pandemic worse, no question. Well, with this being the Church of Leadership Center and the International Church of Society, of course, I want to ask you about your um, very well argued and nuanced description of Churchill, and then and then we'll bring Katie in. Um, so, in your book, you you touch on two things within Churchill's career um, that he has been criticized for. Um, the first being the Bengal famine, and then of course uh, the fall of Singapore. Um, but here's how you couch it. You say that uh, the, your argument that historians who lay the blame solely on Churchill do not heed what you call the Tolstoy principle. Can you explain this principle and, 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 and quickly summarize your judgment regarding Churchill in those two sets? I'll, I'll keep it quick, Justin, but, but Churchill features quite, quite a lot in this book. And that's one reason I wanted to do this event, because... Okay. Tolstoy's War and Peace offers a critique of the idea that the man at the top is, is in charge. It's an it's a extraordinarily brilliant uh, mockery, really, of, of Napoleon's role in 1812 that Tolstoy gives us. And his central argument throughout War and Peace is that what's happening is not really because Napoleon commanded it, though Napoleon has that illusion and many people are taken in. In truth, what's driving people are forces much larger than the ones... Uh, that Napoleon has at, at his command. That, that's a very important idea that, that is why everybody should read War and Peace. Churchill has been blamed, I believe, unjustly for the, uh, the famine of 1942-43 in Bengal during World War II. And he's also been blamed for a number of other disasters, uh, Gallipoli uh, springs uh, to my, not, not forgetting the fall of Singapore, uh, two of the great military disasters of the 20th century uh, in Britain. And I try to show that, that blaming Churchill for events in Bengal is, is a violation of the Tolstoy principle. You're attributing far too much agency uh, to the prime minister. And I, I spell out over a series of uh, paragraphs that I, I don't want to delve into too deeply, how, how we should really think about this and how we should think about disasters generally. The point of failure is rarely at the top when a disaster occurs. Sure, Churchill said some disparaging things about the Indians. He was uh, far from enamored of uh, the Indian nationalist movement. It was a thorn in his side as he sought to wage World War II. But that's not the reason there was excess mortality in Bengal in 1943. As uh, the, uh, you know, the, the literature makes clear if you bother to read it, many of the reasons for their excess mortality were local in nature, had to do with failures in the Bengal administration, and failures that included failures by Indian officials, who by that time were playing quite a big part in the governance of India. Uh, and so the acknowledgement, if you look at the contemporary uh, press, is that there was a man-made quality to this famine, just as Amartya Sen said of, of famines generally, but the men, and it was men mostly, who were responsible were not in London. But the really key decisions that led to the famine were taken in India and particularly in, in Bengal. And in the end, after all his grumbling about the Indians, Churchill gave the order to make sure that there was large scale shipments of grain uh, to the affected uh, area, something that Andrew Roberts gets right in, in his recent Churchill biography. Yes, uh, Neil, I appreciate you saying that in a sense. And, and you, your uh, chapter specifically on, on, the, on this famine details the role of uh, Admiral Wavell and his, and his, um, you know, his urging to Churchill, the middle, not middleman, but middle management and how impactful he was on the ground, thus producing that, that um, cabinet direction written by Churchill to, to you know, use all shipping available. Correct. And Wavell was, of course, Churchill's pick as uh, to succeed 
as as vice so i mean this is an example it's an episode but i i want people to recognize that it's a very important episode in illustrating a general point about disaster and i'll just throw out another example of how this can often work in in 1986 the space shuttle challenger blew up uh, the first impulse of the washington press corps was to try to find a way of blaming ronald reagan who was president and the argument was well the the launch had been rushed because Reagan had wanted to mention it in a State of the Union address. This was total fiction. Nothing of the sort happened. And uh, in a brilliant book, the physicist Richard Feynman showed that what really went wrong happened at the mid-level bureaucracy of NASA, where the, the engineers warnings that there was a 1% chance the thing would blow up on launch were just basically airbrushed out by by the bureaucrats who turned that risk into one in a hundred thousand and and i when i read Feynman's account at the suggestion of one of my colleagues here at hoover i had a kind of moment of epiphany i suddenly realized that's true of disasters generally the point of failure is rarely right at the top because when disaster strikes it's actually more further down the chain of command that the the, the failure really occurs yeah, the buck stops with the president or the prime minister, as Harry Truman famously said. But that's not the same as saying it's the fault of the president if there's excess mortality or the fault of the prime minister if there's a famine in Bengal. Uh, wonderful, wonderful analysis and points for sure. So I'm going to have uh, Katie, Katie Fox join us. So Katie is the vice president, assistant vice president, I should say. I just gave her a... Uh, gave her, uh, um, a raise of George Washington University for Health and Safety. Um, Katie, if I can ask you, I know you've been listening to this, uh, you know, at, at the outset, Neil basically said that it's, it's impossible to plan for every disaster. And, and part of your experience before coming to George Washington was, was nine years at FEMA. Um, and if I can just ask you personally, do you agree with that assessment? I think that Neil is right in that it's, it's impossible to plan for any particular disaster. You don't know when um, you know there's going to be a rupture of a fault line or where a hurricane is going to make landfall. Those things are true. At the same time, you know there are lots of steps that we as a society can decide to take, right? So there has been a great movement um, along the West Coast to move daycare centers out of the inundation zone. Um, for the, why can't I think of the name of the fault line that's um, along Northern California and Oregon and Washington. Um, but so, so there San are things that- San Andreas, and, and those of us who live right next to it uh, don't need, need to, to, to struggle to remember it. <laughs> no, that one, but actually I was thinking about the Cascadia subduction oh. zone. So discovered more recently, and you know, there's all sorts of their schools and, um, and daycare centers and other things within that inundation zone, certainly San Andreas as well. And so we can take steps ahead of time to lessen the effects of disasters. And you know, Neil is right about the disproportionate effects of them throughout. So um, just because we can't predict them doesn't mean that we can't prepare, I would argue. For sure. And if, and if I can say, so part of what I found a very fascinating part of uh, Neil's book within the fascinating book is he lists, um, he lists multiple uh, reasons for um, governments uh, you know, that hamper them from predicting, preparing for disaster. And he, and he lists two that I'd love your opinion on. The first being failure of imagination. And then the second being threat, uh, under, threat underestimation. Um, within your time at FEMA, and, in, in, you know, what has your experience been with those two things? Are, are those two things real? And, and do they play a, a role within governments preparing for disaster? Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I think that the other points that Neil made about, um, you know, tendency to, to fight the last war and then procrastination, uh, all of those are powerful. I mean, that, you know, having spent a good amount of time in the government at the federal and, and local levels, there's a tendency, you know, govern, government is a behemoth, right? And it just moves and things continue. And it is difficult to disrupt that, that movement, that motion. Um, it takes, it can take an extraordinary effort to do that. And so all of this, those factors, the threat underestimation um, and failure of imagination are, are are, are certainly part of the government. I mean, I, you know, it was the 9-11 commission that came to that conclusion um, that there was a failure of imagination. I think, I think there's no doubt about that. And I think 
you know, we as humans are, are wired to not try to think of the absolute worst thing that can happen and then take steps to prepare for it. It doesn't mean though that that's not happening. I mean, Neil mentioned the pandemic preparedness plans in the UK. There were extensive plans. There are extensive plans here in the United States that were never dusted off, never used, or, or never implemented correctly. I was gone from the government at that time, but I can say that they certainly existed. And it's a little bit unclear to me what happened with them and why everything seemed to be, at least from the outside, a pickup game, um, because we had done plenty of exercises and, and other things for it. Um, so it just, it, I, I think that is absolutely a factor. So Neil, uh, in response to, to Katie's last point, you know, the plans are made, then they're not dusted off, they're not updated. What, how does that happen? I mean, I, I mean, it, it seems so simple and this is a very simplistic question, so forgive me for, for saying so, but within your research, what, what is, how does, what's the failure? What, what's the function that fails? Well, I think what's interesting here, and I, you know, defer to, to, to Katie as she has the experience of, of, of being at FEMA is that you can have the illusion of preparedness. You've got a 36 page plan. You probably have an accompanying PowerPoint deck. Uh, you've had a whole series of interagency meetings. When I delved into uh, the pandemic preparedness plans and, and read them, I was struck by the fact that they they existed in almost suspicious profusion. I mean, there were several of these different plans produced by different agencies. And part of the problem was there were too many cooks uh, in the kitchen. It wasn't quite clear ultimately which of the agencies had to lead in the event of a pandemic. And I talked recently to somebody in the administration who confirmed that there were there were meetings that that almost were paralyzed by the number of of agencies represented in, in the room, a pathology that I'm sure you'll recognize, Katie, from, from your experience in, in government, because it's not unique to, to, to the public health space. In fact, it seems to be a, a feature rather than the bug of how the bureaucracy works these days. Think of the financial crisis. There were lots of regulations governing bank capital adequacy in 2007. There were lots of uh, regulations with respect, with respect to the mortgage market. It's just they didn't prevent a massive financial crisis from happening. So I think what we've developed compared with, say, the 1950s is uh, an over-bureaucratized, uh, over-complex system in which multiple agencies think of themselves as stakeholders and fight for their turf in order to be in those meetings, but we then end up with the illusion of preparedness because there's a plan, uh, it just doesn't actually work when the rubber hits the road. And for me, the great clue was in a speech made by the guy whose, whose job this was uh, back in, in 2018, a man named Robert Cadlick, who was Assistant Secretary for Preparedness at HHS gave a lecture in Texas in, in which he, he said something remarkable. He said, if we don't build what he describes as a, an effective insurance policy against a pandemic, we'll be SOL if one happens. And SOL was something I wasn't familiar with being British, you had to look it up. So shit's out of luck. And this is the guy whose job is preparedness, acknowledging that all these plans really won't work if there is a pandemic. So you've got something very profoundly wrong there and I don't think it's unique to public health. I think it's kind of become characteristic of, of the way many Western governments work, not just the US. This is going on in the UK. That's the point of the Cummings testimony. And trust me, it's going on in Brussels too, in, in, in similar ways. It's a general Western problem that we have the illusion of preparedness. Whereas in Taiwan, I talked to Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister there last week. In Taiwan, um, yeah, they had a plan, but the, they also were very quick off the mark. And they use technology in really interesting ways to make sure that the public is both informed and making data available to decision makers. It was the speed of the Taiwanese response and the South Korean response that meant they kept the death toll low. We, by contrast, were too busy, ha too busy having inconclusive meetings in February uh, and into March to actually get get this even remotely right. Katie, I'd, I'd love to have that, you know, you were shaking your head and smiling throughout. So I'd, I'd love to have your your uh, response. 
Yeah, I'll add a couple of things. I certainly don't disagree with the over bureaucratized um, characterization of the government. What I would argue, though, is that this is where leadership makes a huge difference. And I, I wouldn't put it, you know, on the on the president per se, but when you have a response that's going to take multiple organizations, departments, and agencies, and you know, throughout the exercises, there has always been attention if it were to be a public health incident, because there is a question of who's in charge and that it is not clean. And you could see that throughout this disaster, that it was not clean about whether it was HHS or somebody else, or it was HHS, they tend not to have the operational capacity. So you saw FEMA come in and run clinics and do other things. So that was a, a known challenge going into this. What I will say is that a strong leadership in the White House, and this doesn't have to be the president, but you know somebody running whether um, it's the Homeland Security Council or the National Security Council, however it's organized, makes a massive difference because you need to mobilize the, the government and get people to pay attention to it. And that means money and other things that can really only be directed, that sort of you know shifting priorities. Really, I've only ever seen that come from the White House. And that's where I think that here in the US, we did have a massive failure. If you've got people at the top saying that it's not a concern, not an issue, that sends that message throughout the bureaucracy and you get the sluggish and inconsistent response that we got. So, so if, if, if I'm, you know, what I just took from those comments is, you know, a, a centralized um, chain of command, but a, a smaller, a smaller group of decision makers who are, you know, communicating as one, um, you know, from the top, so that the confusion does not flow through into those complex systems. Yeah, and if I can say to toot the to toot the horn of the of the man who's on our who's named on our center, you know, Winston Churchill, you know, when he took over as prime minister, consolidated his cabinet. He created new departments, such as the, the the Air Ministry with Lord Beaverbrook, to address those specific challenges of, of using the same communication, but of centralizing decision making, so that those who were reporting to and actually enacting the the um, enacting the actions knew knew exactly what they were going towards. And, and Neil, if you have a response at all to Katie. Yeah, I think it's absolutely right to, to say that, that the leadership was defective. And in, in Doom, I try to kind of show all the ways in which Donald Trump made matters worse. Uh, he had about one good impulse in the whole thing, which was to restrict travel from China in January. And uh, that, that, if it had been done perhaps two weeks earlier, and comprehensively to include even US uh, passport and green card holders would have been an effective response. He was roundly criticized by the mainstream media uh, for uh, this uh, xenophobic measure, uh, something that people now forget. But subsequently, uh, he really went steadily more and more off course. Uh, and I think part of the reason for this was the approach to an election. Uh, it, it's obvious to me that that any president or prime minister is uh, at some point sitting a in a room with advisors yelling at one another. And if if a few were warning that this was a really big pandemic, like Matt Pottinger at the National Security Council, there were others like Larry Kudlow saying we can't do anything to to derail the economy. You've got an election to win. And that, I think, led to a kind of stalemate. Uh, and then Trump's uh, impulse to be the center of the of attention at all times kicked in. And the more he was doing those press conferences, the more opportunity he had to say uh, crazy things, whether it's about masks, hydroxychloroquine, you name it. So I, I agree that, that there's some variable here that leadership explains. But if you ask the question, would it have been radically different with a different president if Biden had somehow got the job a year early? then I think it's less clear that excess mortality would have been a lot less. It might've been a bit less, but the key mistakes seem to me not to have been ones that you can attribute to Trump, the failure of CDC to, to ramp up testing, which was a really major blunder at the beginning. The fact that we never even tried contact tracing seriously, which I think had a lot to do with the big tech companies. Uh, and then the consistent failure of pretty much every state to effectively to isolate the, the infected and protect the vulnerable. 
those don't seem to me things that you can really trace back to the White House. And yet they're probably the reasons for the high excess mortality. And don't take it from me. Ron Klain gave an interview in 2019 before he became uh, the president's chief of staff this year, saying if swine flu in 2009 had been as bad as COVID, we'd have had a disaster on our hands. My sense is that the person in the White House would not have been responsible for the, the majority of the excess, the bulk of the excess mortality. But Katie's certainly right. I mean, Trump made things worse, not better. I think, Katie, before I get into some great questions, I just want to know if you, if you want to make any further comments. I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree. I think that government can be really creative in terms of bringing in tech companies, bringing them to the table, you know, providing incentives for action and that sort of thing. But you're right. I mean, in, in the kind of government that we have, which is federalist, you're going to have really big differences with different governors. And, and that makes the unified response that's necessary in a pandemic almost impossible. And given the divisive nature of society right now, then I think that, um, yeah, that would have proved challenging regardless of who the president was. Let me add one point before we go to Q&A. If you're gonna get one thing right in a pandemic, it's vaccinations. And oddly enough, uh, countries that did really badly in containing the spread in 2020 did really well with vaccination in 2021. That, that includes the US and, and the UK. And I think there's an interesting kind of uh, irony here. Countries that did really well at, at, at containing the virus last year, uh, unfortunately lagged behind with vaccination because they got complacent. This was the mistake that the Taiwanese made. I think Operation Warp Speed was a huge success. And one mustn't ignore the fact that this administration, which had so many uh, flaws and made so many mistakes last year, got one big thing very right. And the same is true in the UK. The one thing they got right was vaccine procurement and deployment. And that was done, interestingly, by Kate Bingham, somebody outside the bureaucracy who was brought in at Cummings's suggestion uh, from private, uh, from venture capital. So I, I do think that this illustrates an important point that, that applies generally, that sometimes in a crisis, you actually need to bring in the people from outside uh, because the bureaucracy isn't nimble enough. And this, this pattern uh, goes back all the way to, to World War II and even, and, and even further back. There are times when uh, you need the, 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 the person that you, you bring in, whether it's from the military into the civilian sector or whether it's from the private sector into the public sector, you need people who can move a little bit faster than, than the average bureaucrat. And Again, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but back to, you know, May 1940, June 1940, Lord Weaverbrook came in from, uh, who was a, a newspaper magnate, but he knew how to run a large complex system and, and, and thus helped to ramp up the, uh, the uh, construction of, of fighter planes for, for the Battle of Britain. So we have about 15 minutes left. I'd love to get in some great questions. Uh, Neil, this qu first question is for you. This is from your former student and good friend of ICS, Catherine Katz, who is uh, also the author of, of the best-selling Daughters of Delta. Um, she says, you know, in your book that, uh, you know, of course, disasters that follow disasters um, are challenges and provide adversity, but are there any examples um, that are significant developments from a positive perspective that have followed any recent disasters? Well, it's great to uh, hear from you, Catherine, and congratulations on your recent uh, publication. Uh, I, I'd say that World War II is just uh, full of, of good examples of ways in which the, the crisis of, of a truly calamitous sequence of events uh, in 1939, 40, 41, uh, resulted in, uh, in phenomenal leaps forward. Uh, and those were war-winning leaps forward, but they also had all kinds of subsequent spin-off uh, benefits. Uh, the Manhattan Project's favorite uh, example, I noticed Dom Cummings citing it uh, in, his, in his Twitter thread that we mentioned earlier, but it's only one of many. Paul Kennedy uh, recently did a nice book that looked at some of the less well-known breakthroughs that, that World War II uh, uh, forced us to make. So one of the interesting things here is that uh, war seems to be... Uh, 
the the kind of ultimate forcing house for innovation. It's less clear that we move so rapidly in response to other forms of disaster. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a striking contrast that may reflect the different ways we think about man-made versus uh, so-called natural disasters. I'm not quite sure if we'll look back and say how remarkable uh, 2020 was uh, for innovations, because in truth, the mRNA technology that, that has been crucial to the most uh, efficacious vaccines already, already existed. So it may be that war is, uh, is distinctive in this respect. Uh, one reason the Churchill Society is important, and, and this is a point that has just been alluded to quite rightly by Justin, is that Churchill understood this very well, uh, understood the importance of getting uh, technological innovation to, to accelerate in, in a crisis. Uh, and and that to do that, you needed to bring in, uh, you needed to bring in people from the, the world of science as well as the world of business. Katie, um... Here's a question which I, I think I'd love your your response to, um, given your experience within government. Um, Vivian asks, how do governments prepare for future disasters given the speed of technological change? So was was you know addressing technology and, and, and using it part of you know your experience at FEMA? Yeah, this is this is an area where the government struggles, there's no doubt. Um, and so I think though that <clears throat> I'm thinking about um, the about Hurricane Sandy, and one of the the repercussions from landfall was that gas was scarce along the East Coast, particularly in the most populated areas, thinking New York, New Jersey, and um, um, but there was innovation in terms of almost a gas buddy type system, and I don't remember whether precisely that came first or not, but you know, social networking about what was available where there was gas and, and where there wasn't. Um, and so, you know, government does find a way to incorporate some of those things. You know, the going back to Neil's point about the military, that tends to drive things, whether it's GIS or, or other advances. Um, so I think that, you know, the government does its best to try to incorporate change, um, but it is an area where, you know, government is, is not design, the, the processes and things are not designed to, to work at speeds like technology does. And so they are invariably, um, the best laid plans, I guess I would say, are able to incorporate whatever pops up during the disaster and being open to those things. And one of the things we did, and, and I'm a couple years removed from FEMA, was to have people actively monitoring social media to get us a sense of what was happening there and figure out how we could incorporate technology into some of our responses. So it's understanding you're, you know, you can't beat it, join it kind of thing. So how do you, how do you remain open to that and be able, adept enough um, and agile enough to incorporate it? Uh, and, and here's a, a follow-up question just submitted from Eugene and, and, and Neil for you. And you and I discussed this uh, before we started the call. Will AI slash machine learning be the future of predicting upcoming disasters? Um, and of course, you you touch on the you know the, the science um, the science of predicting in your book. How do you feel about that question? Well, I I don't know that the the problem of prediction is really a problem of our limited uh, mental processing power. In, in other words, even if you had artificial general intelligence and it was able to think on a much larger scale and much more rapidly than, than, uh, than us, that it would be any better at predicting uh, when the next big earthquake would hit the San Andreas uh, fault. Uh, because I think inherently these things are not predictable. Uh, the, the thing that you can do is is respond rapidly when you get the first intimation, but I'm not sure that even a, uh, a mind the size of a planet is going to get the, the timing right of most forms of, of disaster. And the same goes for World War III. 
Um, I mean, there are lots of books uh, that, that predict the next war. Uh, it's a genre that goes back a long way. Uh, and most of them get it wrong. Uh, it's just that every now and then somebody is lucky, gets it right, and, and is remembered as, as, as a prophet. So I don't think the problem is our cognitive capacity. I think the problem is inherent in the way that disasters occur. Because in some domains, they're random, and in other domains, they're governed by power laws. And therefore, no computer is going to arrive at probabilities, and, and, and certainly no that, that are remotely reliable, and no computer is going to, no matter how powerful, is going to be a, a, a Nostradamus that accurately predicts uh, the next disaster. AI is important in other ways, though, because, and this, this follows on from, from Katie's answer, as we get more reliance on complex computing power in every field of, of human activity, we become more vulnerable. Uh, so the coronal mass ejection doesn't matter if it happens in the 18th century or the 19th century, but if it happens in the 21st century, our systems are all down, gone, fried, the whole uh, uh, electrical grid is gone. And I think one of the key issues that, that arises when we think about modernity is it's an, it, it's an enormously impressive network with unprecedented levels of computing power. But we're so reliant on it that a major network outage would, would suddenly render us helpless. And I, I, I regard that almost as the kind of most scary near-term scenario. And the little colonial pipeline case was like a, a warning of, you know, if a bunch of crooks in Eastern Europe can cut down a major uh, artery of, of the uh, East Coast's energy system. I mean, what, what can the combined efforts of the Chinese and Russian governments do in the case of a, of a major showdown? Yeah, as, as Katie and I both experienced, it was... Um quite sudden and quite strange. And, and, and personally, someone coming from someone from the Midwest where energy is, is really not that scarce, um, having the entire United States you know, see, Eastern Seaboard fed by one pipeline seems incredibly um, <laughs> you know, fragile to say the least. So this is a really important point that we optimize. That's how we kind of think about things. We optimize because we want you know, the most efficient uh, uh, system and that's going to exploit economies of scale uh, and that creates fragility this is Nassim Taleb's uh, story that he tells in Anti-Fragile one thing that I realized after I had finished the book because you never really stop researching and writing books even after they're published in 57 the hospital capacity of the United States was vastly greater than it is today relative to population there was a lot of redundant uh, hospital capacity hospital beds hospital wards uh, that we don't have today and and that's the the, uh, the same problem we, we optimize for the 99 percent uh, of the time situation where things are working normally it's just that in the tail risk scenario, that optimization is the fragility. And I think that applies right across the board, whether you're looking at the financial system, the energy system, the healthcare system, you name it. Katie, um, this next question is for you, but if you wanted to, to follow up on, on, on Neil as well. So the question is, um, how likely will we face another pandemic? And I'm asking you as, as, the, as the professional who, who deals with health and safety, uh, but also, the question also asked, do you think we will be better prepared to contain it than compared to COVID-19? I don't have the slightest idea whether we're going to face another pandemic <laughs> in the next 10 years. Um, different Proving Neil's point. Public health colleagues, but I think there's no doubt that we'd be better prepared. I mean, you know, the resilience that people naturally show in disasters is shining here. I mean, we're all on screens doing Hollywood squares for the last 14 months. And, um, it, and you know, so we've adapted to that. And I think that some of the concepts that were so foreign 14 months ago, whether they're wearing masks or, you know, sitting outside in the middle of winter so that you could see other humans or, you know, somebody outside your house, whatever it was, will not be so unfamiliar to us. So some of the problems that we talked about before with failure of imagination um, wouldn't exist in this case. They wouldn't be such a barrier to, to entry to those steps that we would all need to take. Neil, if I can ask you the final question, um, you know, this is, and it, it, I, I, I tend to not like counterfactuals. Um, and I, I also tend truly not to answer the question, what would Churchill do? But this is a great question from, um, this is from Dennis. He says, 
what do you, how do you think Churchill would have handled pan pandemic? And was there a Dominic Cummings type uh, person within, within his political world at that time? And, and I would argue maybe not Dominic Cummings type, but you know, Brendan Bracken certainly was somebody who had his finger on the pulse, but please Dominic or Neil. Brendan Bracken was the name that immediately sprang to mind. But I, I think uh, the, the key problem that we confront is that everybody wants to be compared with Churchill, uh, but very few people are prepared to walk the walk. What makes me depressed about my Oxford contemporary Boris Johnson's rise to power is how often he's uh, sought to cast himself as a Churchillian figure to the extent of even writing a quite bad biography of Churchill. And, and this is a fraud on the public, because the thing about, about Boris Johnson is that he's in many ways quite the opposite of Churchill. Churchill was prepared at times to take the unpopular stand. Uh, he risked actually deselection in his opposition to the policy of appeasement, was prepared to be booed or at least listened to in stony silence when he made an argument that he firmly believed to be true. And so one of the things I do in the book is show the price that Churchill was willing to pay for the principles, including other perhaps less impressive principles. I mean, his, his loyalty uh, uh, to, to Edward VIII after the abdication is an example of this. But, but basically, unlike Boris, who, who essentially will follow the crowd in the spirit of the French revolutionary, Ledru Rollin, who said, I am their leader, I must follow them. Uh, he's not a Churchillian, he's a kind of fake Churchillian. And this, I think, is, is part of what Dominic Cummings is complaining about. There's a damning quotation from today's testimony in which he quotes Boris as saying that the chaos is good, the chaos the government was in with COVID, because it makes him, Boris, the centre of, of attention. I can't imagine Winston Churchill ever thinking that thought in a crisis, not, not even for a second. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I will end um, in terms of false quotes. Uh, we've all heard the quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. That is constantly applied to Winston Churchill, but as maybe you and Katie both know, it was actually former uh, mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, who said it. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, he maybe, but, but to your point, Neil, maybe due to the, his experience of willing to risk the cost, those types of mindsets are applied to somebody who, who would who would you would think would be cynical, but he really was a man who, who literally shed tears over the deaths that he knew he was giving, you know, uh, you know, many times in World War II to, to soldiers. So um, I want to thank you both uh, for your time. This has been incredibly fun. Katie, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, and Neil, thank you for writing a wonderful book. Uh, Kat, my, my colleague has put the link in the chat to purchase for everyone on this call. Um, and, and I'm wishing you both a wonderful, wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Thank you very much indeed, Justin. And thanks, Casey, for your Thank you so much. Pleasure. Nice Thank to you. Meet you. Take care.